prognosis. In this video, we will focus on lung carcinomas. So let us look at the different types of lung carcinomas, and it can be divided into two broad types, small cell car carcinoma and non-small cell carcinoma. Let us focus on small cell carcinoma. Small cell carcinoma represents about 15% of, um, of these type of uh, lung carcinomas. More than 60% actually present already with um, metastases. The prognosis of small, lung, uh, small cell lung carcinoma is poor. The tumor tends to grow proximally close to the hilum and involves neuroendocrine cells in the area. Because neuroendocrine cells are involved in this type of cancer, they undergo mutations which allow them to produce hormones, like hormone-like substances that they should not be able to produce. And so as a result, they release these hormones and it triggers a phenomenon known as the paraneoplastic syndrome, which we will talk about later on. Non-small cell carcinomas represents the majority of lung carcinomas, 85%. Non-small cell carcinoma is further divided into three types. Adenocarcinoma is the most common type of non-small cell car uh, carcinoma. Adenocarcinomas make up 38% of lung carcinomas. These types of cancers tend to occur in the peripheral lung tissue, so away from the hilum, and involves glands within the lung. Squamous cell carcinoma is the other type of non-small cell carcinoma and makes up about 20% of lung carcinoma cases, making it the second most prevalent type of lung carcinoma. These types of cancer tend to occur close to the main bronchus and can cause obstruction of the airways. They are called squamous because the epithelial cells that line the airway become mutated and change from columna cuboidal to squamous and essentially dysplasia cancer. The last type of non-small cell carcinoma is large cell carcinoma, which make up about 5% of lung carcinomas, so it is the least common. Large cell carcinoma rapidly grows, like the small cell carcinoma, and can present in the periphery, or the peripheral lung tissue or the proximal lung tissue. So those were the th different types of lung carcinomas. Let us look at the signs and symptoms of patients that present with lung carcinomas. Now, not everyone presents um, like with these, uh, with, with the same signs and symptoms, but the most common signs and symptoms include cough, weight loss, hemoptysis, dyspnea, and chest pain. There are many risk factors for lung cancer. Major ones are smoking, radon, air pollution, arsenic, tar, asbestos, nickel, as well as those family and genetic factors. Now with cancer, because it is a growth, it can cause some problems to surrounding tissues, surrounding organs. So let us look at some mediastinal involvement of, um, of lung cancer. So let us zoom into the media, mediastinum, uh, which, uh, which where we can find the heart, the lungs, and all these other structures, including the ribs. Let us zoom into this first rib area and learn a bit, a bit of anatomy. Um, so here is the sternum and the first rib. Now, going over the first rib are some important structures including the subclavian artery and vein and the brachial plexus, the nerves that innervate the upper limb. Why are we talking about these structures? Well, because these structures have to do with the, uh, with the pathophysiology or the complications associated with lung carcinomas, lung cancers. See, the mediastinal involvement of lung cancer include pancose tumor growth which is growth on the apical lung surface, so on the top, which can block part of the brachial plexus. Depending on how much the brachial plexus is affected, it can cause shoulder, arm pain, weakness, and atrophy on the ipsilateral side, so on the same side. Apical lung tumors can also block a, the sympathetic nerve fiber around this area, causing 
um, what's known clinically as Horner's syndrome. Another mediastinal involvement is pleural effusion, which causes dyspnea as well as chest pain. There can also be heart involvement causing uh, pericardial uh, effusion. Another important structure that can be affected is the superior vena cava, which when blocked can cause the vena cava syndrome. Forget about the inferior vena cava here. This is a complete mistake. Ignore that. So it's superior vena cava. So those were the so those were some mediastinal involvement associated with cancer uh, lung cancer growth. Let us look at the airway involvement now. So the airways of the lungs are the bronchi and the bronchioles, right? Before it terminates at the alveoli. Well, cancer can cause airway obstruction as it impedes air flow. Airway obstruction leads to dyspnea. When there is airway obstruction or irritation, this actually sends sensory information to the brain and triggers the cough reflex. That is why in presentation, we have dyspnea and cough. The patients have dyspnea and cough. Cancer or tumor also stimulates angiogenesis, which is blood vessel growth. However, angiogenesis forms leaky and tortuous vessels, which when ruptures, lead, can lead to, what well, leads to hemoptysis. Okay, let us zoom into the blood vessels. The blood vessels contain your red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells, right? In lung cancer, we see some blood involvement, mainly anemia, which leads to fatigue and dyspnea, leukocytosis in 15% of cases, thrombocytosis in 15% of cases, and hypercoagulable disorders. Lung tumors can metastasize, and they do. When it metastasizes, it goes to the heart, and then the heart will pump the tumor, the, the, the growth, the cancer, either up to the brain and upper limbs, or down to the abdomen area. Common sites of lung metastases include the brain, the liver, the adrenal glands, and the bone. Metastat metastatic sites are commonly uh, asymptomatic. Now looking back to the different types of lung cancer, remember the neuroendocrine cells that begin secreting hormones in the small cell carcinoma? Um, well, it leads to the phenomenon called the paraneoplastic syndrome. Let us learn a bit more about what this encompasses. So the paraneoplastic syndrome typically occurs in small cell lung cancer as well as squamous cell carcinomas. Paraneoplastic syndrome are syndromes that occur not related to invasion, obstruction, or metastases of primary tumor. And they and the paraneoplastic syndrome include the following. Ectopic Cushing syndrome, where the hormone released by cancer cells stimulate the adrenal glands to produce cortisol. We also have antidiuretic-like substance which stimulates uh, secreted by the neuroendocrine cells, which stimulate the kidneys to retain water. These neuroendocrine cells also produce a parathyroid hormone-like substance, which stimulates the bone to break down its minerals and release calcium into plasma, increasing blood calcium levels, resulting in hypercalcemia. Paraneoplastic syndrome also include uh, the hyperpulmonary osteoarthropathy, leading to clubbing and periosteal proliferation of the tubular bone. And lastly, inflammatory myopathies um, it, it can result from uh, lung cancer, which leads to the muscle weakness. And so that is why we see signs of finger weakness on, upon examination of uh, patients with lung cancer. Okay, so that was essentially the pathophysiology. Now, lung tumors can be staged. We will not look at the staging in this video because all I will do is regurgitate what I wrote, but I will draw it out uh, out quickly and leave you to interpret it yourselves. Next, let us look at some investigations uh, we would do if we were suspicious of lung cancer. 
So lung involvement, we always do a chest x-ray to rule out other differentials. Common clinical findings on x-ray for lung cancer include a hilum enlargement, pulmonary opacity, which represents the tumor, three, rib bone lesions, pleural effusion, and also lung collapse. Another investigation which is critical for uh, for this is C, uh, for lung cancer is CT scan and should be performed early to determine stage and management of the cancer. Not only CT scans but biopsy are, are to be performed which include uh, the bronchoscopy which is where the primary lung tumor is visualized and sample is taken using the instrument. You can also perform a CT-guided fine needle biopsy, which is a more reliable way to obtain a histological diagnosis. Um, a needle aspiration. This is where a needle is inserted in the lump of the, on the lung or lymph node to see for lymph node involvement. Another form of investigation for biopsy is the orthoracocentesis, which is where fluid is collected from the pleural cavity and this is used for sampling. Again, our numbers 3, 4, 5, and 6 are used for biopsy to stage the tumor um, so that uh, appropriate management can be taken. And so management is the next topic we will talk about. So these are 1. Surgical treatment, which is the most important. Surgical treatment is for the removal of tumor, of the lung tumor, cancer, for stages 1 and stages 2. After surgery or if surgery cannot be performed, there is also radiotherapy and chemotherapy, as well as laser therapy and stenting. Radiotherapy is less, effect, uh, is less effective than surgery. However, radiotherapy is used in combination with chemotherapy for stages 3. Chemotherapy increases survival up to one year. Nausea and vomiting are side effects. These side effects are managed best by the uh, 5-HT3 receptor antagonists because these drugs will target the chemoreceptor trigger zone, thus preventing the vomiting nausea associated symptom. Laser therapy and stenting can also be done. Airway obstruction from the tumor growth causing serious symptoms can be managed using laser treatment and stenting. So essentially the obstruction of the airway, you basically remove it so airflow can 